to play. And then I noticed it's okay to push them like that. You just have to know your balance. Like, female athletes actually like that push. They, they like to have that physicality in their training. Um, girls, I mean, I enjoy watching girls soccer because it's different than boys soccer. Good afternoon and welcome to the Reflective Coach Podcast with Coach Luca. I'm sorry for a little bit of a delay with this week's episode. However, it was Easter weekend and it was a very rare opportunity to take a weekend with no football, no podcasting and having some time away to take things away on personal life, which has been an absolute first for many, many years in terms of having been around the coaching world. However, here I am with an episode and for this week it just means that you're going to have two episodes in the space of one week and a few days apart, which is great for you as listeners and viewers. Now, I'm very delighted to welcome Coach Hastings, who takes the accolade and record for the longest podcast episode to feature on the Reflective Coach podcast. I was so grateful to Veronica for giving up her time and giving so much energy and so many ideas and elaborations on her ideas, her wisdoms, her experience, insights, stories, and so on within this episode. She had so much to share, so much to say, so much to consider. There was a lot of areas which we really delved into, and she was so passionate in terms of every point which she delved into throughout the episode. It was fantastic to speak to Veronica, and I know we had to stop after a while just to get the podcast recorded, and I look forward to having her on again and having another great episode. But there is so much within this episode that honestly, I know I say it every week, just get a pen and pad in front of you because you're going to have so many different ideas and takeaways to really note down. There's a lot within this episode and there's so many different outcomes in terms of types of coaching, in terms of high school coaching, the losses, the wins, the learning outcomes, the environments, the approach, the support, the upbringing of players, the skills in which they develop on and off the pitch, creating the team, how you challenge players on and off the bench, especially when they're recruiting players to create successful teams as well as creating successful pathways, especially for uh, college programs over in the US, which is so interesting. But that point of challenging players on the bench is that personality which we keep mentioning. Those who want it the most and those who don't. And how you can really get through to the psychological understanding of those players and really get through to their motivations and support them on that journey. But to really ensure that they're maximizing every opportunity. Those who want it most will work hard for it and they'll put absolutely everything into it regardless. They will want to take the hard lessons. They will want to take the harsh feedback and criticisms. They want to learn about what can push them the most or the hardest. So there's a real approach in terms of how you do that and those who don't want to seek that kind of feedback and those who get defensive when they do receive it, it means that they're not ready to get to the top or they're not willing because those who get to the top really have to take that on board and they have to be willing to take criticism. The team is like a second family. There are multiple hats and we've spoke about this before um, and this multiple hats relates to perspective that understanding that approach different outcomes and how you have to be able to support your players on and off the pitch so whether it's as a big sister in terms of veronica's case whether she has to be the mum in terms of telling her off um telling off the young players that she has whether it's being that coach and really guiding them through um whether it's being the psychologist the supporting mechanism in terms of a mentor the counselor there's so many different hats and Sometimes being that older sister, that mum figure can really benefit players, especially female working with female. And as we say with men, you know, oh, the coach was like an older brother, a coach was like a dad to me. And that's what, for example, Cristiano Ronaldo says about um, Sir Alex Ferguson and Michael Essien says about Jose Mourinho. And the, these are absolute key roles that we have, especially when there are there may be that abundance of that family member within their lives and you really end up naturally being like an older brother, the older sister, the mum, the dad, the uncle and so on just by being there and it's just that attachment that a child might grow and that's a key consideration within itself in terms of how you may be seeing that portrayal, that perception 
how you may come about it naturally, that relationship which you might have, how you can support players on and off the pitch, and it really is so much in terms of how you are seen as a professional, whether you're a coach, whether you're a teacher, or a youth worker, and so on. You really have those those parts which you play. Um, and team is as, as a second family. Now, I read something on Twitter a few weeks back um, from a teacher who called her classroom a, a family, and there was a lot of kickback from that, and I, I was quite surprised. Whenever I talk about the team that I had for seven years, I always talk about being a family because that was the basis of our team. That was our philosophy, the psychology, the values that we inputted. And they really are a second family because we're always going to be there for one another. And we always came through the hard times when we were always there. So I was quite taken back by that. But in terms of football, I think there is such an importance of being that second family and it creates that unity, especially when you are going through the highs, the lows, the winning, the, the losses the progression, the loss of players by going on their own routes and channels. And you're always going to be there and you're always going to invite the players, the coaches and so on who are involved. Veronica then talked about different groups of players which has been mentioned on previous episodes about female players, how they may listen, how they may apply it, how that might be different to males and how they might not take that information on board again relating into that perception that psychology that understanding those who want it most and sometimes coaching girls can be a lot easier she talked about the importance of being a good role model preparing psychology for the years to come especially for younger players how do we de-stress players that is such a critical question which is really at the forefront right now and listening to a lot of other podcasts and a lot of other insights the ex-professionals are currently saying you have to put the people first more than the tactics right now and when we talk about how do we de-stress players is how we can put the people first and really get through to them we talk about core timings and how this may fit in to training sessions how we may approach players when we're approaching them when we're supporting them asking those key questions around their well-being and how we can really be there for them she then talked about the types of coaching in America and what may be consistent in terms of the game might be ready to move on from certain things and that's more of an American side of the thing I believe and something that keeps cropping up as I keep speaking to the American coaches and um, I think it's going to really delve into coach education and how that curriculum changes across the board in America but that is such an interesting growth avenue and me and Veronica spoke about that growth avenue as well um, she talked about functioning as one uh, players uh, taking rests, talking to each other, supporting what the coaches might say, um, what are the aims of what we're not, what are the aims of that way we're doing, what are we not doing, how do we approach it, female athletes and how they um, may have that image and something that Candice touched about was that portrayal of female athletes, female coaches, considerations around their well-being. Uh, I love that Veronica literally built on this without having this freeway network as such. Um, and it was talking about the, the, the image of females and the eating disorders that they may have, which is a key consideration because females might be a lot more body conscious, then they want to be thinner, and then they have that eating disorder, then they're not getting the right nutrients, then they're not performing, then there's a psychological kickback, then their well-being comes in, then they might be safeguarding, and there's so much which comes into it. And so you may be a grassroots coach, you may be thinking, well, what does this have to do with me? I'm not a professional coach, or these aren't professional players, but I'm telling you, even at grassroots level, these are some key considerations to absolutely take on board and to be aware of, um, and to really apply yourself in terms of understanding um, we then talked about coach sharing how we can work as networks and, and utilize other coaches and what could I do to help us get there we're all in it together as said by Rob Porter on a previous podcast episode we're all trying to develop players for the succession of the game now at the highest level you are competing for those wins for those trophies but when we're at the lower levels we're all trying to get players to get to those levels we're all in it together so it's how we can grow and these consistent messages being repeated by other coaches and being a consistent theme right throughout is just showing how important those messages those outcomes those aims and those objectives are and as you can hear it, it's all about that person perspective and that comes right at the forefront of what every coach says now this has been the longest intro to go with the longest episode but there is so much which veronica says 
and I had to condense that down into some key points. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. Veronica was wonderful. It's such a great individual to have on her passion or energy the absolute support that i've received from her over the last few weeks on social media platforms away from the podcast as well as supporting other episodes and uh, coaches and professionals that i've had on i've really really appreciate it veronica this one's dedicated to you i hope you as listeners enjoy this as much as i did it is on spotify youtube and podcast addict you can listen uh the reflective coach cod the reflective coach podcast on those platforms it is at trc podcast underscore on twitter you can find it on linkedin as well this is coach luca the reflective coach podcast drop a like drop a follow drop a subscribe leave a comment i really appreciate it again get that pad get that pen ready listen up Good morning or good afternoon. How well, are you? Good morning, good afternoon. It's, 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 I'm good. You okay? Yeah, yeah. You know, just fighting this. There's like a head cold or something going around. But otherwise, pretty good. Fighting the uh, the fatigue now. The Winter League is getting ready to kick in and all the planning for that. How all right. Yourself? Yeah, no, I'm good. Yeah. Uh, I had a very busy, hectic first week back in work and... Uh, Everything's sort of getting back in the swing of things now, really. So uh, it's not been a, a bad week to sort of get back into it because our ga- our trainer was called off in the week because of low numbers still. A couple of boys on holiday injuries and our game's off tomorrow. No uni started back yet. So it's been a, a kind of gentle week, but next week is bang straight back into it for, fully. So Yeah, yeah. I, I noticed this year there's been a lot of injuries. Um really random injuries too and uh we had a lot of players out this season and it kind of made it hard to get the games where we wanted it yeah you know um in the season itself but hopefully next year will be will be different for fall season for us yes it sounds similar because we've had quite a few injuries we have quite a big squad so we have a squad of 20 24 players um so realistically on a match day if they all put available um, then we've got a tough decision to trim down the squad. But some weeks, like last week, we were absolutely struggling. It was only till last minute for other boys come forward. And um, we ended up having two subs because originally we had seven players. And we were told we couldn't postpone the game. So if we were to forfeit, we would have been out of the cup. Uh, we would have had a fine. And, and therefore, you know, we would have been impacted. So originally we were going in yeah. with seven players. Um but it was just the back end of obviously like Christmas and coming into January, boys mm-hmm. still on holiday. and uh, So it was an interesting start to come back with, but we ended up going out of the cup anyway. Um, so it's just focusing mm-hmm. on the league now because I think we've got something like six games left and our league's done then for this year. Wow, okay. Yeah. Busy, busy. It's a lot, right? Absolutely. And and I suppose you How can see you the same. Manage that? It's tough. It's, it's, it's tough. Um, it's, it's, I've, just, I've just stepped up coaching 19 for the first time this year so obviously some are high school boys some are working boys now some are looking at unis um, some are mm-hmm. trying to get into what's called our seniors team so we have first, seconds and thirds um, so they're playing okay. with uh, male, well, senior males on the weekend who could be you know, 30, 40, 50 and so on um, so where they're trying to break in and trying to cut their teeth as such to try and get into the first team um, mm-hmm. It depends on what kind of player we got, whether they're really focused on wanting to be in 19s, whether they want to pick up minutes as and when, or whether they played on a Saturday and they're available. Then we've got all the other factors where they could be working, they could have gone out the night before, um, mm-hmm. holidays, injuries, and it's a different one. It's not like I've just got a squad to focus on and, and manage the injuries and holidays. It's these boys trying to fit in the first, seconds and thirds, and if they get picked, then they're either unfit yeah. and available or not as motivated to play on the Sunday then um, because mm-hmm. because of what their focus might be. So it's a difficult one, but it's been quite interesting to learn from so far. Yeah, I, I think the same. Um, I started actually coaching last school season and I played my whole life. So I thought for sure, I got it in the bag. I'm going to know how to do this. It's going to be cake. Coaching is completely different than playing. And I'm learning so much. High school is a lot because it's not just 
the sport that you're teaching them. A lot of it is also social um, and how they handle the losses and the no's. Um, they get a lot of no's. And how do they handle sitting on the bench a lot as opposed to being out on the field? How do they take that? Do it, some players are very humbled by it and you see that change. You see them working harder. They put in all that effort. Um, other players, they take that as a very negative thing and they're like, I'm done. Um, and then you have those the small little, the social things of the, the bickering and really trying to make your team almost like a second family. Um, so you're really doing, you're wearing multiple hats on a field with these players. Um, I, I, I want to say maybe female players can be a little bit uh, more hard at times, um, but they listen when, you, when they're really there, they can be really present and they apply it. Um, guys are a little bit easier because they're, they just do what you tell them to do and they don't really care about the, the social things per se. Um, the dramas um so those are the two differences that i've learned um, from being out there but you as a coach are always learning something um, my season for varsity was four and ten and for the longest time you know it was our, our players just couldn't keep up agility wise just, they, they were struggling uh, we had a lot of great uh skill technical ball skills and stuff but we struggle with finishing mm. and at one point in time it was the coaches it was us that we were looking at inwards okay what are we not doing right what are we failing with mm. our players that they are not able to finish and so it was a lot of long nights watching film seeing you know what wasn't working and then going back onto the field and really there were times where we came in, I, it's at the school, so we would come into the classroom, we'd put up the film, we'd go over one specific area. We're going over it, we're talking about what could we do here, what could we do here? Okay, now let's go outside hmm. and let's put that exactly on the field and let's see how we can do it. They do great with it that way, as, as opposed to just telling them, if they can see it hmm. in the film um, and then apply it, right there it's I, I just see magic every time and I wish every every team every organization every club whatever I wish they had that ability to always watch their films yeah and it's not just mom or dad you know doing it um but it's changed sports has changed since I you know played in high school and growing up and we didn't have all the the social media to help get you out there, um, things like that. So I think it's great um, that they, you know, different sports have these abilities to get athletes out there and recognized and it makes it fun. I think it makes it fun for them. Keeps the drive going. I think if I was, when I was younger and I, and I was able to put my, my film up on the internet for people to see, I think I would have definitely applied more um, so it's just interesting. It's cool. Massively. And there's so many different points there which, you know, we could pick on and pull one off. But, you know, the, it's, it's great, as you say, and it's great that you say about video because that's something that I've tried to look at this year for our 19s and try to give them a different perspective. And if they can see in terms of mistakes they made or whether they could have a better opportunity of passing or how they could have broke down play or um, whether they could be in and out of possession, how the transitions, etc. And so that's something I'm definitely trying to look at and trying to push the club to invest in because it's such a big tool. And if they can sit there and, and see, all right, I can do that, instead of having to either recreate it in practice or have to go off what me and the assistant coach have saw and then repeated it back to them. In video, we can sort of stop start pick it up and then try and execute it in practice as such so you know i think the use of tool is such an important um yeah. a tool to sort of invest in especially whilst it whilst it's available and it it really offers so much especially with youth players because we're trying to develop that knowledge and those social skills and if we can create their understanding especially at high school or extend it um it allows them when they get into seniors or try to push for the scholarships or try and look for pro then they can certainly understand the game because we can look at a lot of the development technical um, of the players 
um, and we can spend a lot of time on the grass but I think a lot of players can struggle with understanding the game psychologically because they either don't watch the game or um, they might not understand concepts or they got the technical grasp of it so I think for me when I always coach I always think of what information can I give the players how can they better understand the game and try and have that all-rounded um, understanding of the game which is really important um, but yeah it's, it's certainly you know an interesting concept there and especially interesting in terms of what you say about coaching female and male athletes um, mm-hmm. I, I really enjoy coaching female players because they sort of want to soak up all that information and they've always got so many questions to take on and they're excellent listeners whereas as you say boys just love to get straight into it they, they can uh, just switch off from that and just want to get the ball rolling kind of thing and sometimes that can be great because you can sort of skip past some of the dramas behind it etc um, but then it can be difficult if they are not listening and don't want to create that social context so it's an interesting one I think coaching boys and girls is that fine balance and sometimes you might really yeah. coach girls and go right I love that bit and then you might go into boys and go I love that bit so it's it's that swings and roundabouts really sometimes you might delve into one and prefer it over the other um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's great that you want to create that second family. And that, for me, that's what I always tried to create um, in football. I remember mm-hmm. seeing something on Twitter once in terms of an educator and what they say in terms of when they're in the classroom. They never want to call um, their class essentially a second family or even try to have that dialogue. And I was sat there reflecting on it. And, and part of the reason was is because where these kids might not have that at home, etc., or they might not see classmates as a family, then it, you're sort of disrespecting them or you're creating an environment where that child might feel uncomfortable and then I was like how this sort of reflects in terms of what I do in football then because I always want to create a family I always want that team dynamic so I spent a lot of time thinking on it and then as I thought on it more and more I was like well that I'm not going to change that concept for me because being a family is so important and even when these players like I've got 16 17 18 19 year olds and they might want to go abroad or they might quit football and get jobs or they might be in the seniors and then they stop playing or they might move clubs they can always come back to this club and they've always got these relationships where the boys might still go out in five years time and see each other etc and for me it's so much more that we're creating long term compared to short term and again so many points but i love the social media one you say because yeah. it's majorly huge in america social media and you see so many <laughs> players put it on twitter like i'm going to the uh playoffs or i'm going to the 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 mm-hmm. um the weekends that you have i forget the name of it it's gone out of my head um and the, the a lot of showcases like when they do a lot of two days or like they'll do like a real here goes my two days and it's it really pulls you in you're like oh what's going on yeah, it's amazing. Like I just love seeing like the platform online for a minute. It seems to be so common and accepted in America, whereas we sort of get players... It's not as big here in terms of what those showcases and players putting themselves out there because we sort of got a very different system here. And I think we could take so much of what you do in America, like showcases, like the online platforms, and then you could teach all those skills in high schools in terms of kids and online safety and how they put themselves mm-hmm. out there and how to market themselves, how not to market. And that creates a whole education platform because when players make it so- uh, scholarships or they make it pros, they don't know how to cope with a lot of that. Um, and then, yeah. then it explodes. So I think there's a lot more we could take. But... In terms of a player going on social media, if they're put out on there, there's a lot of criticism because they're like, well, play, family are trying to push, push, push. And okay, you might get that in America, etc. But here it seemed to be uh, a big, massive no if a kid's got social media, whereas in America it's yeah. highly accepted and, and sort of looked at. So, but so many points there, really. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, my mother, she's from Spain. So we grew up a, a good while over in Europe. Um, and then when we came here to the United States, it was a shock because I'm used to a culture where everybody was very tight knit. Mm. Um, and so when I came here, it was just more not so tight knit. Um, and I noticed it also with, with, in some ways, sports. It was more me, 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 as opposed to what I was used to in Europe, where it was more of a unit, like everybody functioned as one. It wasn't just one person. Um, but it was also the how the drills were ran. Um, it was just more more drill like harder. You did you did a lot of running, a lot of crunches, um, bicycle kicks, a lot of core things. 
And when I started coaching, I, I love my head coach because he's very much like me in the mindset of we like we like the old school drills, you know, the technical stuff because they work. Those fundamentals work, um, and it's okay to change things up. So it's great that he's like that with me because I notice a lot of other coaches sometimes they're afraid to push their athletes or they over push their athletes. So it's hard to find that good balance. And I remember when I took over a week for the JV head coach while she went out of the States. And I remember the girls just for a good, I don't know, 15 minutes were just chit chatting, didn't want to listen. And I just kind of let them do their thing. And then finally I, I, I asked if they were all done and they're like, yeah, we're done talking. I said, great, let's go do some running. They did running, we finished that practice. The next day when they came, it was all core. It was all agility. They hated it. You know, they were, they were doing so many crunches, so many squats, all these things. And at the end of the practice, they actually came up to me and they're like, man, can you do this every day? Like, we feel good, we feel strong, we're ready to play. And then I noticed it's okay to push them like that. You just have to know your balance. Like female athletes actually like that push. They they like to have that physicality in their training. Um, girls, I mean, I enjoy walk, watching girls soccer because it's different than boys soccer. Girls soccer, the physicality is different than boys soccer. You know, men's they totally play completely different men's soccer than women's soccer. I, there's nothing similar the intensities are completely different it's more so what do you want to see um and so when you really see female athletes really like knock it up on the soccer field and they just have that that strength behind them it's really empowering for these high school players to see and then when they see that they're able to do the same workouts that these university players these college players that they're watching are doing that that thought of I my dream to be there one day turns into oh I can actually do this it's really not that hard mm. and you know I tell them all the time you know somebody that went through a double mastectomy it was a five year journey and I was told I was never going to be able to do one push up again because they had to pull the muscles out of my back and put them in my chest and I did push ups with my girls on the field all the time i took all those no's and i told them let me show you all the yeses and so i tell them every time i step on this field look at me and remember that no's are just words we are our only person the only person that can tell us what we can and cannot do and when you think you can't do it you can and i and i i tell them all the time like i don't know if you struggle with confidence um, on the field, you know, I, I haven't really coached my own men's team, boys team. So when I watch the boys at the high school play, they always look confident. Mm -hmm. um, my girls, you can really see when they struggle with confidence. And so when I start to see that, I remind them, it's okay that you don't believe in yourself right now. I'm going to believe in you until you believe in yourself. And I'm going to keep telling you, yeah, you can do it. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to fail 99 times or however many times, but it's not really failing. You're just learning 99 ways how to do it yeah. another way. So you get it the way you want it. You know, it's like perfection. What is really perfection? It's just one man's opinion. Your, your version of perfection is not the same version of my perfection. So that's something that I teach them all the time when they go out there. Don't compare yourself to that athlete per se. You can pick some things that you really like that they do, or like, oh, they have really great through balls, or they have an amazing corner kick with a left foot. I wish I could get my left foot to do what she does. Okay, great. So you like that ability. Just hone in on that one thing that you want to achieve hmm. when you get your mark off. Um, you know, soccer is really hard because I, I, I'm going to say it's 
I know there's a little back and forth and I'm probably gonna kick myself in the butt for this, but I think soccer athletes are probably the most fit athletes um, because we're always constant running. We're always turning. We don't really get breaks. I mean, our games are like 90 minutes. I mean, they're going. Um, so I think soccer players, they really have to push through not just a physicality and the endurance and the fatigue that can set in and just the wear and tear on your body within that just that one game, but it's also a psychological game too. And so you have to prepare yourself psychologically for what can happen in a game. You know, everyone hates going into PKs, you know, overtimes and having to do all that because the added additional stress, right? So how do we help our players de-stress those moments? You know, I, I, I've i had a player who never misses, you know, when she has to take PKs and she doesn't, you know, stress or whatever. And, you know, she gets to these moments and you see it, these players that normally don't choke, choke, right? How do we get them to come down out mm. of that? How do we get them out of that, you know? And I think as coaches, that's kind of our job too, because that same situation will occur in their own lives, whether it's jobs or, I know some people don't like going up to their boss and talking about something that's uncomfortable, right? So how do how can we de-stress ourselves and get us to a point where we can calmly think about what we're doing, mm. you know, to get to point A and point B. So it's a lot. It's definitely a lot. And you're always looking inwards as a coach because you always have to be um, on on point with everything. You know, you have to worry about what you're doing image-wise. You want to always be a good, you know, role model for your players. Um, set a good bar, a good standard. Um, and I think as a, a female coach, that's even more so important. With now, you know, you're seeing more female refs, uh, more female coaches, and it's hard. It is not easy as a female coming into a male-dominated mm. world with sports. Um, a lot of the times you'll get overlooked. Um, you'll be minimized. Um, so it, it it can be hard because you're always feeling like you're having to work a little bit harder. Um, but I think it's good because it shows um, the ones that are watching you um, to work hard for things that you want. I'm coming into this late, 36 years old. You know, I've always wanted to coach. You know, I waited till this past year to start doing that. Um, and a lot of that was confidence. And then finally I said, I can do it. You know, I tell my players all the time. I tell my students all the time, it's time to apply it. Because if I start applying what I preach, my players will start applying the same thing. So it's really, we're coach, we're counselors, we're friends, mm -hmm. we're, we're their safe haven. You know, sometimes our players, they, they just need a safe place to go. Maybe home's not a good place or whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, but they know they have that field. They have you. Um, I told my seniors this year when they graduate, don't ever lose my number. I want to still be a part of their life journey, their successes, um, what they're doing in college, whatever other clubs that they are that they're playing. Um, keep in contact um, because I'll always be here if they ever need anything. Um, so I think it's important that they know just because if they step out of high school or they move on to the next step in their life, the friendships and the connections that they built do not just go away. So I think soccer is great. I love it out of all the sports because it's just, it's, it's more than just soccer. Of course, and it brings so much. Yeah, and as you say there, you are doing so much. You are like a counselor. You are like a support worker. You are, you know, essentially a good role model. You're a parent, essentially, because they might look at you. You might be seen as an older sister, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're the manager, and then you're the coach, and then you're the psychologist, then you're the fitness coach, and then you might be yeah. the physio. And sometimes when coaches get straight into it and they think, right, I'm going to be a coach, and then I'm going to be the tactician, they don't realise how much more they have to care for their players or sometimes just have a drop in call with them or um just ha just to care about them and just have that because 
yeah, obviously coaches have their own ambitions and what they want to do in the game and, and where they want to go with it. But sometimes along that journey, they have to sort of step over players and step over teams to try and pre- position themselves to get the high positions to continue up that ladder. And and then it's difficult in that sense because, as I say there, they are essentially stepping over players. And even though they're coaching these players and they've got this contact time with them, it's not like they're building these relationships or bonds at times because they're literally there to deliver sessions, get their tick box and try and get up that ladder and it's so difficult to see because um, I've been at a club now for five years and I've seen uh, endless amount of coaches come and go over the years whereas I've been lucky enough to coach go right through levels and still be involved at some capacity and Mm -hmm. I still have relationship with players but sometimes I've seen these players over like a three year period then I've seen them have coaches come and go and they've had so much instability in that sense It's, it's been quite difficult for them and we are essentially playing with their lives and their time and and that's a big three-year period to sort of take in that aspect because that's a lot of progress, a lot of opportunity, and they might have learned from so many different perspectives and coaches might have given them so many different messages. And But th- that could be hard because then they are having so many different messages, etc. And after three years, it's a lot of different change for them rather than that stability, which could hamper their progress at times. And then when you see the players maybe get the 16 and they haven't been offered the scholarship, then they drop off the conveyor belt as such. It's so sad because then you've sort of got this pool of talent which is conveying and then there's just a pool building up of wasted talent, essentially. Um, Mm -hmm. Of course, you get some players who literally aren't good enough for it, no matter how much, by 16. And they could end up playing at seniors and then they might be an okay senior player and that's good. But if they're not good enough for scholarship, then they're not good enough. But you might have this talent pool which are literally so good enough for a scholarship um, etc and, and, but they, their career is over essentially unless uh, something really happens from it um, and it's so sad to see them when it comes to that but it's great that you say about de-stress and prepare psychologically for games I think they're two real important conditions there mm-hmm. really to take in consideration but when you say de-stress players how do you go about doing that then? Well, um, there was one day we were getting, it was towards the end of our season, and the stress load was through the roof. I mean, the girls were kind of like picking at each other. It was terrible. We actually brought in a yoga instructor on the field, and our practice was just yoga that day. And it allowed them to just kind of go through. They got a workout still doing yoga, but it was quiet. They de-stressed. They talked for a little while. We do a lot of, I started to incorporate more like fun team bonding games um, that they can do on the field with each other, where they can do like racing one, you know, one team and the other and things like that. Or we'll do um, like team bonding. And the rule is wherever we are, it stays in that area, it doesn't go. We, you know, we don't fight with each other. We just let it out. We have to hear each other because that's family, you know. Um, and we do. And we will talk about what stresses each person out. And the team is usually great at helping each other find ways to, like, de-stress. Or sometimes I'll just take the player if the player is, like, I'm really uh, – I'm. I'm gonna cry, Coach Hastings. I, I I can't. I will just tell the head coach I'm gonna walk my player, mm. and we'll just go for a walk, and I'll just allow them to talk. Or I tell them to find things at home, like write it down. Um, or they'll just sit down on the field, and I just have them observe. Because sometimes I feel like if your players definitely, for sure, are not in the right headspace, they they're not gonna play. So sometimes just sitting and just watching the game is better for them mentally um, because then chances are you're going to run into an injury because they're not paying attention because their head's someplace else. Um, I always just, I check in with my players. I start group, there's always a group chat. So I'm always communicating with all the players. If they ever need anything, they know where to find me. Just different things. Every player is different. Uh, but we definitely try not to keep every day so structure, structured in a sense so that, you know, maybe the next day it's just fun. They're getting that break. Um, 
So maybe it's the first part of the practice is just we're doing some drills and then the rest is just just careless, you know, just whatever kind of games. Let's just take some shots on goal, whatever. Um, but we're always really big at talking. That's at the end of every game, we'll sit in our circle and we'll talk about that game before they leave or that practice. Um, we'll talk about what we didn't feel we did right and then what we can do right. And then everybody usually goes home. Mm -hmm. They'll think about it and they'll put it in the text. Oh, I, I actually really thought about this. Um, and they know that what each player is saying isn't an attack on them. It's, it's to help them be better. Um, because sometimes, you know, you do have players, like you were saying, that want to go to that next level. You know, I have players that want to play at D1 colleges, you know, universities. But sometimes what prevents them is their behavior, their attitude on the field. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes how to help them, because, you know, you know, the whole thing when you're a kid and mom and dad are saying, you can't do that. We don't always listen to mom and dad, right? Because we think we know better. Sometimes you deal with that with coaches, right? You're telling them, you know, you got to watch what you put on social media because it's going to be a no-no for you one day. Like, you can't put that up. But that's not okay. Or your behavior on the field. They don't always hear you. So if you set up meetings, like we took our girls to the University of Maryland and they saw a game and some of them were able to meet with the coach. And the coach there did say she will absolutely hands down pass on a player that has absolutely phenomenal footwork and can play the game of soccer mm. if their attitude was horrendous because then it's just going to be like an infested sore on your team and it's just going to spread it's going to be awful and so when they hear that, they're like, oh, that right. Okay. So then they start becoming more aware of what they're putting. And so when those players that want to be D1, D2, or go to colleges, they hear that, their attitudes change on the field. And then they become more aware of everything that they're doing. That's kind of, I always stress them, please watch, you know, the pro leagues watch how they how some of the players handle themselves yeah you're going to see them kind of getting on the ref but you're also going to see times where you absolutely know that that call was just crap and it shouldn't have been what it is but is that player getting in that ref's face nope they get right up they get right where they're supposed to be go back to their formation and they continue to keep playing because nothing you say to that to that ref on that field is going to change what he just did. I can promise you that. So it's good for them to see that because they themselves sometimes want to throw their hands up in the air and say, come on, ref, what I did, what this, what that. And I'm like, it's not going to change his mind. Stop. I don't want a card. Stop. <laughs> so it's, it's those things. So it's good to see them apply what you're putting down. And when you see a player that was really high stressed in the beginning of your season and things that normally would have stressed them out, they're not stressing out anymore or it's far less, you know that what you've done that season has worked. Mm. It, it absolutely has worked. Uh, I mean, I've had players that didn't really have confidence and always needed reassurance and they don't need that reassurance anymore. They don't come, they don't repetitively ask for, for these things because they're able to just apply it. Um, but I also think that is parents' involvement sometimes too, depending on what level you're playing at. I think when parents participate um, and there are really good support systems for your athletes, um, you, you can really see that um, with them on the field. I think it also makes the flow of things sometimes um, it's easier, especially if you don't have an assistant coach um, and you're kind of doing it by yourself. And if you're doing like middle school and the parents really help out, that that does make it um, easier. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think it's great just to see the involvement 
Um, but again, the different ages are so different. Um, it'll be interesting going into the middle school season this year. Uh, I start in March. So it'll be, and they're girls, so it'll just be different to see the different ages from high school to middle school and how they apply things that, um, that I'm gonna set out for them. I also have to remember, I, you know, I can't play them like I play my high school girls. <laughs> So um, a lot of planning goes into that because I'm still trying to plan my high school girls. You know, I have winter that comes up tomorrow. My winter league season starts tomorrow. So, um, you know, that's a seven B seven formation. So trying to figure out what players show up and mm -hmm. what's neat about that is we can literally there's I can sub whenever I want. It, there's no limitations. So I if I want to pull a line just have a girl, just have a set of five girls ready to just sub in whenever I can do that, yep. which is really nice. I don't have to wait for the ref. Um, but some I, I've never coached before. So that kind of makes it a little hard for me to kind of pre-plan how I want them. Of course. You know, who I want where. Yeah. Um, but I think in some ways that's what some of us like about coaching, right? It's the constant challenge for us. And we're always being challenged. We're always learning. And I love that about coaches. I love to surround myself with fellow coaches that want to further their learning. You know, you have some coaches that say, okay, just got my license. I'm done. Let me just go coach. I like to surround myself with coaches that always want to better themselves. They want to, you know, whatever new course came out, they're taking it because they want to get that extra knowledge or convention, whatever the case may be. Because the more knowledge that you have, the more things that you participate in, I think, is just for the betterment of your players. Mm. Um, because you never know. Some of your players may want to be coaches, right? Yep. And they may want to be refs, right? So, see, that's the other thing. We have players that are looking up to us for a wide variety of things, okay? So we could be their coaching idol and we don't even know it because they haven't told us, right? So that's why it's always important that we're just on our best all the time and we're always, when our, we expect our players to wanna to go to college, right? Some, especially if they're in high school, we're like, okay, let's graduate. You wanna to go to college, you wanna go play, you could go for a scholarship, what do you wanna do? Or even for jobs. We always push them to be a better version of themselves. So I feel as coaches, we should do the same things for ourselves. Um, and meeting new coaches, there's something that a, one coach may do differently than you do, and you actually may like that. And it may click. It may be that missing piece that you needed, right? Um, you know, like I said, finishing. We really struggled with finishing this year, and my head coach and I, we've been – putting our heads up against the wall and we're gonna fix that. Um, we're not gonna run into that problem this, this season. At least we're gonna try not to. Um, but talking with other coaches, you know, it's the awareness of what do you see that I could do better? Or what are you doing for finishing as your drills that, you know, this is what I'm doing, what are you doing that maybe I could, could help us get there? I think having a mentor or just coaches not being afraid to share, I think is so important. You have coaches, you know, they'll sit here with their with their book and they're like, oh, I just did this plan and, you know, it took me a couple hours. And I'm like, man, let me see it. And they're like, nope, nope, you can't see it. Because then if you use it, uh, what's the point, right? Yeah. I don't know. I feel like in some ways that's how we all learn, right? If we share. Um, I have a buddy of mine who coaches um, for his own league and we'll sit there at work, you know, on our breaks at school and he'll, he'll show me what he's doing for drills, you know, his mind, how, how he's thinking, you know, if his team is going to be set up with more possession to attacking or is it going to be more defensive? I love to have those conversations. And I feel like that should be more of a common, normal thing as opposed to let me protect what I'm doing over here. 
Um, because I don't think soccer is all about winning. I think soccer is more than that. And, and I think that's where we've lost it in some aspects along the way where it really turned into wins. Yeah. You know, uh, my season, yeah, my, my varsity season is 410. A lot of people would say, it's terrible. Yeah, but every time my girls walked off the field, we celebrated. And we actually had, we had a game against Magruder. We lost, it was 7-2. It was one of our rival schools and it was just awful because we could have done so much more and we just struggled. Um, but we still celebrate. There are teams that are like, why are they, why are they cheering? Well, they lost, man. Why are they over there? Like, yeah. Woo and it's because we actually did accomplish some goals that we set prior to that game that we discussed before coming out there whether the other team didn't realize it. So we won in more ways than what 410 is telling us and what is telling the rest of the world, okay? Our JV team, we did three, four, and one. That was great. You know, it was our head coach first season coaching ever. She's never coached before. And she walked away three, four, one. I think that's great for her first time, phenomenal. Um, so I think I think as coaches, we need to also not focus so much on, we have to win this game. Mm. Because that's an additional pressure that you're not realizing you're putting on your athletes. If they always feel like they have to win that game, they're playing at a whole nother stress level that they, sh that they really don't need to be playing in. They need to understand, yeah, the game, the, you know, the goal of the game is to win. But it's okay if we do not win. As long as we are playing to our best capabilities, and we're not just kind of half running around or watching the ball. And that's my biggest thing. I, I, it's a pet peeve of mine when soccer players just watch the ball. Like, you should be able to bring that ball down. Don't let the ball hit the ground and then kind of wait for it to settle. Go to the ball. Be first to that ball. Mm -hmm. If I see a player that is just not wanting to be first to that ball and just dragging, why? That makes me think, why are they doing it? Is it stress? Did they not eat? I think that's a lot of things coaches also forget is nutrition for our athletes. Are they eating okay? Most female athletes struggle with, struggle with eating disorders over male athletes. I think it's imperative as a coach that we be mindful of that with our female athletes because female athletes, they, they worry a lot about image. And a lot of female athletes, they feel if they lose weight quick, it's gonna make them faster. It's gonna make them better athletes. And that's the contrary. You deprive your muscles of the nutrients that it needs and the sources for energy. Mm. You're gonna be fatigued. Your attitude's gonna suck. You're gonna be naggy, complaining. It's so many different things. So I think we have to remember that because if we constantly push win, 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 you're going to see that stress level hit differently because our athletes are students. They're, they're somebody's son's daughters. We don't know what that additional stress can cause. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's an eating disorder. Sometimes they're harming themselves. Sometimes they're trying to get mixed up doing other things, whether it's drugs, alcohol, whatever the case. So that's why we always have to make sure that it's a positive environment for our athletes. We're not yelling at our athletes. Um, we're not, there's so many things you can say to an athlete that doesn't have to be negative. Um, like there's a there's a, a saying, we won't tell, we will not ever like scold our players if they're playing absolutely terrible. They'll look over at us and we'll literally say that's under good. Under good. And they know like, okay, I need to think about what I'm doing. We won't necessarily tell them initially, especially if they're out there playing. Mm -hmm if they're along the sideline and they're kind of looking, you could do better, that's under good, let's fix it. That allows them to think for themselves. Okay, what am I not doing right out here? It allows them to recenter themselves, look at the field and look inside and say, okay, I, I probably should have been, I probably shouldn't have chased that, that's not my position, you know? 
I'm I'm defense. I'm on the back line. I shouldn't be way up there. I got to come back. I lost track. Um, so I think it's, you know, how how we communicate to our players. Um, there are times where I am yelling to my players, like, that's the third time you've done that. Think about what you're doing, you know, because I don't want to pull them out because mm-hmm. what, what primarily they're doing is working, but now they need to realize that one thing. Now they need to fix that. Because I also feel like if we take a player out all the time, they mess up. Are they really learning? No, they need to be in as much game-like settings and in real game-like situations as possible to learn, to be able to apply. So if we're constantly pulling them out, it's a disservice. Um, So I think it's finding the right tone and the words and how to communicate with our athletes out there. Mm. And if we lose a game, I don't know about you, but it it really bothers me when I watch coaches yell at their players on this, like after the game or even during the game. And that coach is getting really frustrated and he's turning around and he's yelling at his bench. You can see all the players just like, it's like a flower. It completely wilts. I mean, and it's upsetting because it's like as, you know, as a parent, as a, as a fellow coach, as a, a paraeducator in a school system, whatever the case, like, that's somebody's child. I wouldn't Absolutely. want somebody yelling at my kid like that. Find a, a better positive way to get these kids mm-hmm. to realize what they're doing is not right. Um, there, there are times where at the end of the game, we haven't said anything to our players. We're just, guys, I got nothing. Uh, I just want everybody to go home and think about what they did. How this game went. We'll come back and practice and we'll talk about it. But I don't really have anything to say. Sometimes that's how we leave it. And sometimes we don't have anything good to say, don't say it at all. And so that's, you know, I think it, it's hard, you know, sometimes. Because there are times where you just want to let it out. Right? And especially if you're frustrated with a ref that is calling absurd calls. I've had some absurd calls. We actually had one player that from the opposite team that came in towards the end of the game and wasn't even wearing the same jersey. Like it was completely different, and it was breaking all the rules. And the mm-hmm. ref didn't do anything. And then at the end of the game, he was like, "Oh, I didn't see it." You're gonna call my players for everything for having a band aid covering their jewelry, but you're letting somebody play with a completely different style jersey. And it's legit, like, so there are times where you have to just realize, like I said, it doesn't matter how much you yell at the ref or wanna try to get them to see your way. It, it, it's irrelevant, you just have to learn to just roll with the punches, the curveballs, and just make the best out of it, because that's life. Um, and I, and it's like, we're, we're teachers. Or counselors, sometimes we're people's other parent that they may not have. So it's it's a lot, and so I I definitely think education for us is important. You know, I take a lot of classes on um, youth, um, like I said, with like eating disorders, nutrition, um, just abuse in general, because I think when we're as coaches, when we're coaching kids, we need to be able to recognize. Um, when there's something not right going on with our kids on the field. And it also helps us be more approachable. Mm. It, it helps us give off a safer vibe for our students and our athletes because they feel like in some ways we understand them a little bit more, right? Um, so I think, you know, to constantly further educate ourselves is is wonderful and i don't think people should be afraid to share what they're learning or what their plans are especially if they put a new drill out and it really worked i think it's phenomenal if a coach comes back on twitter or whatever and posts it up and says, you know it says this i tried it for the first time here are the pros and cons to it but overall i think it was phenomenal 
I, I think everyone should try to, you know, give it a try or whatever. I love the feedback, you know. I, I would love to see more of that. And I hope, you know, as more podcasts come out, I hope, you know, people start to apply the things. I hope they're listening to what mm-hmm. other coaches are saying um, and really just applying it um, because I think it's important. I think our youth, you know, our youth is our future, right? So we have to make sure that we're not causing any more um, negativity to our youth. We're, we're creating a positive, confident youth that believe in themselves, um, that they're able to go after their dreams and achieve it. Um, and I hope we see more female refs. I hope we see more female coaches. Um, anywhere in general, um, head coach, assistant coaches. I, I just hope we see more head um, coaches in general that are female. Um, and I hope that we see more more cap- capable ways of being able to watch female sports. Um, you can go into a lot of pubs, bars, um, restaurants, and most of the sports that they're playing are men. You don't really see female soccer or um, any other female sport, except for like swimming or skiing, things like that. Um, so I think it would be great to get more you know, air time. Um, and then I think it would push the younger generation to really step out of you know of their set you know what what per se but like what a girl should do you know like i grew up in a household where they said girls couldn't coach girls couldn't go hunting that's kind of guy things um when i turned 18 i said okay all the things that you said a girl couldn't do i'm gonna do and it made me a better person you know i can fix cars on my own i can maintain my own house i can fix that drywall I can I can do a lot of things you know I can hunt I'm very self-sufficient um, so I think it's important for just females in general to realize that you're not set in a box mm-hmm. um, and don't be afraid to step into a man dominated area because if you have the same knowledge or experience or even Chances are some have more experience or knowledge or whatever, and they just never shared it, you know, because of it's a male dominated world. Mm. Um, I think if more do it, I think it's good. Um, I enjoy watching soccer on the European channels because you see a lot of female um, comment, you know, the, the, the hosts that they have there, they're not just regular hosts that are there just to help the program go along. They actually know the sport. They're talking about it, Mm. um, the positions and how it works. Um, And they think it's great for the youth to see that, you know, that, you know, women can be up there and they can run a soccer program, you know, on airtime and in a game and, and they know what they're talking about. And it's, wow, that's amazing. Okay. I want to do that. Um, so I think it's great. I enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to the women's, you know, World Cup. Um, I'm excited to see how the USA, you know, girls, you know, women's team is. I think they're going to do wonderful. Um, I'm looking forward to it, and I hope, well, ever, as many people that watch the men's, I hope we still get a good bit of people that watch the women's, um, because, it, like I said, it's a different, it's a different pace of play, right? Yeah. They play so different, and it's it's a different fun, different excitement. Um, and the fans. Um, I had some friends watch soccer for the first time with the World Cup and, and all that, and their comment was, I had no idea soccer fans were this intense. It's not like that with American football. It's really not like that with hockey. Or, or any of those other soccer fans are intense. How they, they paint their whole bodies. They, I'm like, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, this, like, people 
who play soccer most of the time, they're raised around it. Mm. They live and breathe soccer and the passion that they have. And I, I think that's kind of hard to come into the United States. I don't know if you deal with that. Um, if, if you watch um, American athletes here as opposed to European athletes, passion is different. It is so different. I get it. Being someone that is European, I get the passion. And I have a player on my team that is so passionate. And I love her passion because she loves the game. And other people will, other people don't understand that passion. Hmm. They think, oh, it's too much. She needs to bring. I rather her, and I rather have 10 players like her that are hungry and passionate about the game than somebody that's not so passionate. Yep. Because then they're lacking a little bit of that drive. Um, so it, I, I, I noticed that it's just the, the passion is different. The American soccer, when you're raised here, it's, it's a little different. They're just, I don't know how to explain it. it it's, it's like a job. I want to say it's almost like a job. But when I grew up, it was just something that you just lived and breathed. It wasn't a job. It's, if we weren't doing homework, we weren't, you know, doing something with family, we were outside. Mm. That was what we were doing. And all we could think about was soccer. We we're watching it, we we're looking at it, we we're, we're reading about it, we we're dreaming about it, we we're talking about it. Here, it's a little bit different. They, a lot of athletes play multiple sports. They go right from soccer to like, like a basketball or something like that, it, multiple sports. I only played two sports my whole youth, and it was soccer and basketball. And it wasn't basketball until I came here to the United States. Um, and it was only because during winter season, I was bored because my parents couldn't necessarily afford mm. the club soccers here in, in America because they're so expensive. So I played a winter sport that wasn't soccer related, um, but I missed soccer the entire time. So I, I do think it's great that there are options for indoor yeah. and, and things like that um, because it keeps the kids busy. It keeps you busy. It, um, and I, I, I think it's just great for the sports in general. I love the popularity soccer is getting now. I love it. Um, and I hope it just continues to keep going. But I also think it goes to we as coaches, it's our jobs to create a positive um, club, a positive organization um, that's not filled with negatives. Um, you know, we want people to think about soccer as a as a positive thing for their children, where their children aren't going to get yelled at mm -hmm. for not achieving some of these um, goals or whatever. Um, so I I always want somebody to think of me as a coach and say. I want my kid to go coach, you know, to go train under Coach Hastings because she's phenomenal, you know, and I think it should be that way across the board. Um, and how we do that is by always keeping ourselves accountable, educating ourselves, going to these conventions and conferences and learning about the new safety things that are coming out, um, equipment, you know, mm -hmm. how can we get the films and for our players, you know, how how can these clubs um, come up with something that we can provide, you know, for, for the players, for all these teams? That would be, you know, wonderful. Um, I don't know if it's somebody needs to start a company or something where, you know, that set company, you can, can come out and record people's films or whatever the case may be. And, and I don't know, there's ways, there's always a way to be able to provide these things. Hmm. I mean, we're coming up with equipment that we can strap onto our athletes' feet while they're playing soccer and it's telling us how fast they're running and, and all this other stuff. So if we can have a machine that's telling us our, our heart rate, our respirations and all that, then we can afford to manage to do those things or whatever. Then we can manage to try to get film in because again, we have people that want to be coaches, right, and reps. So if we can show them how we put up the film, mm -hmm. how you how you can slow down the film, work the film 
athletes, to educate your athletes, that may be, again, that one spark that they need. Like, man, I, really, I actually really like this. You know, because not every athlete, not every person, everyone learns differently. So they're not all gonna learn the same by just going out on the field because some people can't see the field, right? You know, it's, some people need to see it on paper and, and pen or on a screen or in a video where they can slow it down and see that transition. So I think, again, as coaches, that's part of knowing our players. How do they learn? How can I help them? Okay, they're not getting this drill done on like I'm trying to get them to do this. Why is it that they cannot do this? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because they need to see it differently, right? So I think all coaches need to be able to find different ways to, to educate and to teach and train our players because no one's the same. I had a, a student, um, you know, you get students with different different needs, whether it's an audio thing, like if everyone's talking, they can't take in what you're what you're telling them, right? So they're gonna shut down. So sometimes you have to take that that player, that student, or whatever, outside the classroom or off to the sideline and then have that one conversation while everybody else is just doing that so that they can soak in and just focus. Yeah. So it's just it you're always rolling with it and you're always learning as a coach I've learned so much and I know I'm going to continue to learn and I know the middle school is going to teach me a heck of a whole lot um, and I think that's all part of life right um, we kind of all want to better ourselves um, and we all you know we like to share what we learn with other people um, and so I think these podcasts are great. I enjoy listening to them. Um, and I know a lot of my athletes listen to podcasts, so they like, they like this content. They like to hear what coaches and, and refs and just club members and just people in general are looking for, hmm. because then it helps them focus on what they need to do. Um, a lot of times I, I like to tell my players to go back and watch a lot of videos that Kobe Bryant put out because he was a phenomenal athlete. Where every time he stepped out on the basketball court, he did not play to his strengths. A lot of people actually thought Kobe Bryant played to his strengths and he did not. He was a man that played to his weaknesses because he said the only time I can better my weaknesses is if I am playing them in a game like setting in an actual game and forcing myself to use those weaknesses because then they will get better. Mm -hmm. If you're always using the same thing that you're used to, are you out of that comfortable zone? Are you really pushing yourself? No. And so, you know, I think it's important that they look at those things, that they listen to those things because they won't always hear what you're saying. They may hear what somebody else is saying. You know, that may be their idol, and maybe they don't know that came out. So go back and listen. And he was phenomenal. He, his work ethic was amazing. Um, and he, he had dreams, and he had a lot of no's along the way. And, you know, look where he stood. He was a phenomenal coach. He was a great role model. He was highly educated. He always pushed himself. And... And I think that's what we all should strive um, to be as coaches um, and as role models for our, our, our athletes. Um, but we definitely, with, uh, you know, the mental health and all those things that are going on mm -hmm. you know, that in the world, and it's really impacting our youth more than anything. Um, I think that should be one of our top priorities as coaches is to always be mindful of their mental health um, and, and being able to, to know when our players are not mentally healthy that day. Um, it's okay to check in with your players and say, what did you eat today? Did you get a good lunch? You know, are you ready? You ready to 
practice you do not eat a bunch of fluid intake i think it's good because sometimes our players are not playing to their best because they do not eat right so it's part of us checking in with our players um, i always bring bread i the girls laugh at me all the time because i i always have food i should just be a live vending machine mm. that you just pull food out of um but there's always bread because you just never know if that that athlete couldn't get to their lunch because maybe in school they had a test or that weekend they had so much going on that morning with their family they just they couldn't grab lunch and now they're here at practice mm -hmm. and in their head they're like ah, i got it it's okay i got a good breakfast it didn't matter i didn't have lunch I i'll be fine but they're dragging there's bread there's always going to be bread there um so i think you know we just we wear multiple hats and you have to remember that multiple hats and don't be afraid you know to check in at all and i also think that's part of uh having that good communication with parents um that sign their kids up with the club mm -hmm. and stuff like that know who your parent you, your your athlete's parents are um because if you see something that looks inconsistent with your athlete you can have those conversations with the parent if you're talking to the athlete and it doesn't seem like you're getting anywhere. Then because you built that rapport with the family, the parents, mm -hmm. or guardian, whoever it may be, you know, it'll help with that communication then. Because maybe that maybe that athlete is just not comfortable communicating it. Um, or they don't know how to find the words, but maybe their guardian or whoever is with them know. And you can have that conversation. And then you can say, ah, okay. All right, uh, I, now I understand. Thank you. You know, like, so it's not just sports. It's not just, it's not just about the field. I think it's interesting. A lot of it's changed though, like as far as rules. Um, I don't know. I, 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 in some ways I wish games didn't always end in like PKs. Because you could have like a phenomenal game and then it's like you go in to like PKs and then you may have dominated that whole game to the very end and then there you are, yep. you know, um, but that's the game. Uh, there was the, this, this season we had to deal with, um, like JV, you don't really go into overtime, you play the game. but you can go into overtime if both the coaches agree. You know, we ran into an issue once where we didn't agree on one of the games we wanted to go into overtime, but the other coach played and the ref was like, overtime it is. And we're like, we're like, we're, we don't want to go into like an overtime and then go into PK. Like, can we just leave it at this? And we, we ended up winning the game, you know? And it's those things, it's like, I wish the set rules, I wish the rule wouldn't be like that. Well, if two coaches kind of agree, then they can do it. But then you have that grayer. Well, that one coach just said no, and the other coach said yes. Mm -hmm. But then the ref's like, yes. You can't really fight with the ref, right? Like, so I just, in some ways, I wish they would just leave it as can't do overtime or there's no PKs, there's no golden boot, any of those other things. Um, and they just keep it simple. Um, but I also... I don't, I always understood the difference between JV and varsity as far as I always knew that varsity, you should already know your technicalities. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, your ball handling, how to work where your position is, know what your job is. You should kind of know that your varsity program, you should just be implementing everything that you've learned. Um, you should be focusing more on plays, your setups, looking at films, things like that. I don't see that always um, between varsity and JV programs. They're really ran like two different programs. So then when your JV players go to your varsity, it's like a shock. They're like, well, wait a minute. That's not what we did. Like. We were doing all this other stuff, like how do I, like, 
Because so we think if if programs like JV and varsity programs run the same, and they understood um, JV is you know basically the workhorse of your program. Yeah. You're gonna drill, drill, drill like crazy. Do all the running like crazy. You know, practice your corner kicks till you're dreaming about them in your head. You know, like all those things. That's what you're doing on JV. And then when you get to varsity, you're like, ah, let's go play. Let's have a like a seamless game. Um, let's look at the films and see. Wow, all that time I spent on JV. Look, it applied. Like JV. You know, varsity is a little bit more laid back. And it, in some ways it should, but I'm not seeing as much like workhorse um, being applied in a JV program and then both of them working together. Usually it's like the varsity coach is here, the JV coach is here, they all communicate sometimes, um, but the pro like they won't practice a lot together, mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. Um, I wish a lot of programs would just run the two the same. And and because then it also helps your players understand that you're one program, right? High schools, you only have a boys soccer team and a girls soccer team, and then it goes varsity and JV. So it's really two programs, the boys and the girls. But when you talk about it, a lot of people here, it'll be four. It'll be, oh, I'm on the JV team at this school. Oh, I'm on the, great. What happened to, oh, yeah, I'm on the soccer team at this high school. Oh, cool. Are you varsity or JV? Oh, I'm varsity. Oh, cool. All right. That's cool. You know, like, but slinging them out all the time, even with practice and plays, I don't think we're, it's, it's a disservice to our players because a lot of times JV players would prefer to play with the varsity players hmm. because they're being pushed. Yep. to a higher level of play, right? Yep. And what do we always tell each other? If you stay doing the same thing, you're going to get stagnant, right? Because you're not pushing yourself to be better. That's what we're doing to our players when we don't allow them to play with varsity players. We're allowing them to be stagnant. We can give them 101 drills, but are they really getting better just playing with themselves on, this, on a JV team? Chances are no because you're not putting them with a higher caliber player that's going to push them. That's going to give them a higher, you know. When I got on the, it was before one of the games and we were missing some players and I got out there and I told my girls, I said, she's going to kick a corner, kick in. I'm on the opposing team. Don't let me get to that ball first. I'm going to be on you. You're going to feel me on you. That ball came in. You cannot imagine how many players were just kind of like, kind of running, but not kind of running. And when I was on that player, I was on that play. And the first comment that came out of her mouth was, holy crap, Coach Hastings, you are so strong. No, I'm really not that much stronger than you. The difference is my intensity and I put a body on it. The physicality, hmm. I was on it. It was the intensity. I'm not afraid to go after it. And so those are the things that they need to see. Okay, varsity players are going to be more physical because they already know what they need to do. So they're going to beat you to the ball. They need to understand where to place that arm, that hand. To, you know how many times I see soccer players push off on the tops of the shoulders. That player is not going anywhere. You can push them all you want, but you're really not going to get them off center from the ball. You have to go around their waist because their center of gravity is their waist. So if you're pushing that player in on their waist, chances are they're gonna come off that ball a lot faster than the top, right? It's amazing how many JV players and a lot of younger players don't know where to push off, how to push back on a player. And so again, that comes back to fundamentals of JV. You got it. Maybe some days your drills just need to be Bodying up on somebody, push back. No, nope, that's that's wrong. Let's do it again, um, because then they become better players. They understand the physicality. They're pushing themselves, um, and it, it, and I think it's great that we get in there with them. 
Um, I don't think it's always necessary that we know how to do everything, but I think if we aren't afraid to get out there and play with them sometimes, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's positive. They, they like to see that. Um, because I know when I run with them or I do push-ups with them, I know they prefer it on days that I don't because I'm asking them to do something. And if I'm asking them to do it and I know I can do it, and all I'm going to do is just walk around the field with them and explain these drills with preventing me from doing that one push up or five or 15 or that one, you know, lap around the field, nothing. Um, and it, it brings you closer with your players and it, it also takes that hat sometimes. Um, some players are afraid to come up to coach because coach is coach. Oh, but if they realize I'm just a regular person like you and me, mm. and I'm approachable and you can come and talk to me about anything, then you're in a better position with your players all around. All around. I've had more players come up to me and talk to me about personal things and, and tell me um, how thankful that they are that I'm, I, I've come into their life and that they are a better person because of me. That's how I know I'm doing my job. When you get these random cards, I get random cards in the mail from my players. You know, thanks for, for being such a positive role model for me. That's how I know I'm doing my job, right? If my players are coming to me and they're trying to me, or I'm seeing the growth within that, that season, I know I'm doing my job. If I don't see any progression in my program, eh, then I know I'm not doing my job. And there have been times I've had to look inward and I haven't done my job. Um, but that's hard, you know, because I think all of us get, if you want to say lazy sometimes um, with certain things and maybe we could have been, um, we could have done something a little bit better. So. We can't be afraid of failure. I think that was my biggest fear with applying for a head coach position uh, in middle school. I've never done it. I love kids. You know, I've only coached soccer for one year. So I had a lot of, a lot of doubt. And my head coach, he was like, Hastings, you got this. The girls at the high school love you. You're phenomenal. You know, you're, you're a great coach. You coach them in more ways than none. It's just because it's you. Don't worry about it. Just go. Mm. When I told some of my, you know, soccer players that, I forgot to tell them initially at first that I was still going to coach them. So I was like, I got, you know, I got this head coaching job over here. And they immediately started getting upset. You're leaving us? Like some of them wanted to cry. And I was like, no, no, no. I'm so sorry. No, I'm doing both. I'm just really nervous, but I'm excited. And they're like, Coach, you're going to be fantastic over there. They're going to love you. Um, so I think when our players are voicing what they see positive in us, then we're, then we're hitting it. We're hitting it on the mark every time. Um, and we just, I think sometimes though it can be hard like when you're having a stressful day, I don't, in some ways, I, I, I hope we do a podcast on this because I think it might help some of the coaches out. How do coaches, when you have to coach that practice in the evening or on the weekend and it's just bam, bam, bam with work and maybe you're just having an off day and so you go to practice how do you, because I see it, how do you separate it? Mm. You know, how do you not take maybe your down mood or your stress or whatever and leave it off the field? How do you not sometimes project your frustration? Because um, I know as a coach, there are times I've had long days you know, just with work and film and there's like one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, I'm working and then I'm getting up at five o'clock in the morning 
for work. And then I have practice every single day. I'm tired. There are times I just go to the practice and I'm like, go do your two laps. When you get done, come back, get ready for this. And I'm like, they're like, coach, are you okay? Yeah, I'm just so tired, you know, like, but they get it because I'm also in the building with a lot of them. So they see I'm always constantly running around. But how do coaches in general just work through that mental fatigue? Work through all the planning. When you're, when you're coaching more than one team, how are you getting your normal job done? And uh, you know, and just dealing with your normal stress. And then going to your practices. How are you fitting in all that time to for your planning? Like I, I seriously sat here with my book and there's still nothing on my page. You know, like it's you know, at one at some point, you know, you get to you get to the page and you're like oh man, I know what I'm going to do, but why can't I put it down? I'm just so tired. How do we get through that? What do we do? What are good ways to break through that training block, that mm -hmm. coaching block that some of us can get? Um, how do we, how do we find a way to get ourselves back in a, I want to say sometimes more bubbly, personality when we're back on the field with our players um, and even when we're getting so frustrated with our players how do we not project that you know like sometimes it can be hard how do you not I I, I know I, I've seen some coaches they get so frustrated with the player they pull them out and they're like just go sit at the end of the bench and then they'll go to the end of the bench and then they're yelling at them so how do we find ways where we just let the frustration go and we just yeah. go sit on the bench and we just think that that. Um, so I, I hope we do more conversations, more more things of um, just positive de-stressing things for our coaches. We can't sit there and read a book on the sideline or slap a podcast in our ear while we're trying to coach, right? So, and I can't sit there and eat myself. <laughs> with stress I mean I do I'll eat the whole time I'm coaching um, but how do we get through that mm -hmm. there are times it keeps me up at night you know I can't I can't turn it off how do we turn it off I'm sure if I'm doing it my players are doing it yeah. right um, so if we can find a way for ourselves how do we and then we can help them I have I have some players that stay up at night looking at film too and there are times I'm like go to bed don't go home and look at film. Just go straight to bed. And they're still looking at film. So how do we how do we stop? How do we put a stop button in ourselves and our players for for our mental health break? How do we just hit the pause button hmm. and come back? So it's interesting. I don't know. I enjoy it. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I, I'm trying to my goal is to attain my D license eventually go pro um, I've contemplated on refing on the side so I want to you know get some courses going for that um, because again uh, I say we practice what we preach right um, I think we need to see more female coaches so if that helps by getting my face out there and maybe some of my players see me out there coaching you know and refing some games um, that's great there's, there's one player uh, I've, I've asked her probably a million and one times, are you gonna coach when you leave? Are you gonna coach when you graduate? You know, you could still kind of do it when you go to college, you know, like, she was like, no, I don't know, maybe. What about refing? You'd be good, you know the game. Like, I don't know, maybe. So I think sometimes if they just see somebody that they know doing it. You know? Yeah. And they realize, hey, it's actually kind of fun to do like on the weekend or whatever when you don't have anything else to do. Um, no, I think it would be good. Um, so that's what my focus is on in between, you know, coaching winter and getting ready for spring. And, you know, then we have the summer. Soccer's year round for me. I think mm -hmm. I might get, had we have gone further in the season, we would still 
be dealing with, you know, soccer and stuff. But um, since we're here with winter, um, it's just quick games. Um, so it's not too stressful. It's just the actual schools that, you know, you really have to put all that, a lot of that work in. Um, but it's fun, you know, I, I wanted to, I, I started off with doing the summer league first before I, um, our high school season kicked in because I actually got hired towards the end of the school year. Um, so our season was over. So I didn't really get to get my hands wet with that. Um, but I wanted to do more rec things, you know, because I feel like if we coach high school, if you want to coach high school or middle school or just anything in the school, and then you do rec and you do club, each one provides a different level, right? Each one provides a different atmosphere for the sport. Um, so I think it's, I think as a coach, that can also be helpful because you understand the different the different leagues and how they play um, and the different caliber. Like rec is so relaxed. Club is more more serious. The expectations are, are higher. Um, in high school, you know, you want to get to states, you chance. Um, you know, and that's more so varsity as opposed to JV. Um, so it's, it's different. It's cool. Um, I enjoy it. I've always been a educational, you know, hungry person, uh, whether it's through podcasting or reading or hands-on. Um, I actually prefer to, to do more things hands-on. If I can get into a class that's hands-on or go to a convention, or conference, whatever the case may be, I would prefer to do that than online. Mm. Uh, because I think then you can real time, you know, if, if you have an idea, you can show what your idea is on the field. It's hard to always try to communicate um, what you see in your head. Um, and just with being hands-on, sometimes you can transfer that a little bit easier to your players um, because you've done it. You've done it, the physical aspect of it. I think doing anything physically um, makes doing the task easier. Um, I myself, if someone is verbally telling me this play, this person should be running over here and then throw a through ball here. I'm like, let's just write it down. Let's draw a picture or let's go to the field and let's, let's, let's see what you want, what you're trying to tell me. Um, because it's, again, it's the flow. Mm. Um, but I hope more, like there's not a whole lot that comes around this area in Maryland. Um, like the conventions or conferences, they, I think there's one in Pennsylvania, so that's about two and a half hours away, or there's Cali, California. Um, I just, I got into finding out about these conventions and conferences late because the awareness and just pushing it out there wasn't mm. really there in my area. So I didn't know to say, hey, I'm going, yeah. or else I would be there. Um, but I plan on it um, next time. And, you know, hopefully soccer keeps keeps going the way that it is. And our programs, like, you know, just keep developing and they keep getting better and we keep pushing each other. Um, to be better coaches and we help female coaches that want to become coaches or refs. We help them along the way to, to get there. And um, I think that's what I like about Fridays when on, like on Twitter, where we, um, you know, some people will just drop different coaches names, you know, for coaches follow Friday and stuff. Um, I think that's great. I met a lot of coaches that way, a lot of great coaches with a lot of wonderful backgrounds, like diverse backgrounds and the knowledge base. It, I mean, is is just remarkable. If I have a question, I know I can reach out to any of them and they'll provide it. Um, and again, I think that going back to what you're saying with social media, you know, 
that's the wonderful thing about social media now. Uh, I can connect with somebody all the way across the world I, I've never met, and we can discuss soccer. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And and try to bring awareness to things. Um, there was a time when we couldn't do that. Um, so I hope we keep using these platforms in a positive way. And you know, I the negativity that can follow with comments. I think we all need to remember that we are we. As people, we are always learning. When we ask questions or we're putting up a situation that might occur, we have to remember to not be judgmental when responding and not attack people for for things that they post. Just help them understand a different point of view or how they could have made handled that situation a little differently. Um, I think it's okay to, you know, to to help each other out and give recommendations or, or things like that. But I don't think as coaches we, you know, we should argue with each other or um, say negative things. Or what I don't like is when one coach will say another coach is a terrible coach on social media. Mm-hmm. Because my whole thing is, do you work with that coach? Do you personally know that coach and how they are with their athletes on the field? A coach can have a bad day. A coach one day can yell at their kids and it's awful. Does that make them a bad coach? No. Our athletes are on Twitter. They see these things. So if they're seeing their coach, you know, um, putting down another coach or, or, or anything like that, it doesn't set a good tone. And again, it goes back to what we put on social media. Because if our athletes are seeing that we're putting things that are not appropriate on social media, they start doing that. And then that's a chain reaction. Because there goes that scholarship that they wanted. There goes that opportunity to play in whatever it is that they wanted because that negativity that they just had. Mm. So and we can't afraid to, we can't be afraid to have those conversations with our athletes also. Um, so that's why whenever I'm on social media and I see um, a situation where a coach is asking for guidance, like this is how I responded. What do you all think? Am I over analyzing this situation? Mm-hmm. I always try to just give an honest, my opinion perspective, take it or leave it. You know, just to try to help them because. As coaches, sometimes we can get very, very narrow in um, our focus and we lose track. And sometimes we can lose the ability to retrospect, right? And so we should make it okay. We should make it a norm to get on social media and, and ask other coaches, how would you handle this situation? Or I'm struggling with this. Is anybody willing to help out? Or I'm new to coaching. I have no idea how to run my program. What should I do for tryouts? Can somebody help me? You know, do you know how many coaches would be like, hey, I was there. Um, So this is what I did. I think what you should focus on maybe is this. What if that coach comes back and says, well, I'm not really good at putting down drills. I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, don't worry. Here, let me show you what I did. You can use this. Here's just a template to go off of. You can adjust it once you get a comfortable with it. Damn, that you just helped that that new coach out. Mm. You just took that stress level down. And that's kind of what we need, right? Because not everybody can get an assistant coach or have somebody to help them or is able to find somebody with experience in doing that. So if we can somebody across the world is willing to be that person to step up and say well this is kind of what i did i think it's wonderful you know i it shouldn't nothing should preclude trying to to better each other um and i even let my players do that i don't know about you do you do you ever let your players like they'll think of like a drill or whatever and they'll come to practice and they're like coach um I, I really like this drill I've been working on. Uh, can, can you do it? Do you let them run the drills? Because I do. 
You have to. It's player ownership. And I can reflect the many sessions I've delivered in a session and some young people I've worked with and have gone, oh, oh, can we do this? I've got this core game. And I'm like sitting and listening. I was like, right, let's run through it and we can do it. And Because it gives them that onus and it's something that they want to do. And if, if their friends are having fun because of it, then it connects the group closer together. But it, it gives them that leadership. Then can they problem solve? Then can they, you know... Uh, take on aspects of the session and how can we grow and develop it then I might take something away and go do you know what I can actually keep this or I might have that game and then if you're with a different group and then you come back to that group a few weeks later and then you go to, and, and deliver that game again then they're like bouncing because they're like oh I know this game we've done this the other week and then you've taken that away and it, then it helps build that trust and they're glad that you've taken on board what they've said, they've listened, and mm-hmm. then you've taken that away and, and delivered it again. Then they're like, oh, do you know what? I respect that coach. And even for young kids who can't comprehend or think to that extensive level, they will essentially love you or like you as a coach because they've gone, oh, he's doing that game again. Cool. And it's, it's mm-hmm. that buy-in which is, really works well with, with younger players especially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, again, it's knowing your your athletes, knowing your audience and and what to apply. Um, I think it's great, again, because it allows them to think, right? We want our players to be able to problem solve when they're out there. If we're constantly telling them what to do, we're never really allowing them to think on their own and come to their own conclusions on, on what they're not doing right or adjustments that they need to make. I know as an individual, I wouldn't want somebody constantly telling me what to do all the time, right? I want to be able to think and problem solve on my own. Um, and it helps them. Um, and I also think it shows ownership. Um, and it shows leadership. We want these soccer players, you know, we want our athletes to have leadership, right? Um, because on the field, if let's say your teammate misses the shot, and had it happen you know they skim the goal the post by just a hair and their head goes down they're like oh, we needed that how many players run over to that one player it's okay you're gonna get it next time don't worry about it it's okay good try and they all go back in formation there's a lot of players that don't do that there's a lot of teams that don't do that and so i think it's important because it it helps them build that leadership that coach that inner coach right um it allows them to recognize, it allows them to plan, um, it allows them to feel part of the team. They have a say, their opinion matters. Um, and they do come up with fun ones sometimes. Um, I think some of the most fun drills and practices have been from players. And it's because they know what each other like. and. They spend forever on their phones and I'm sure they talk to each other about, you know, does this look fun? And, you know, in some ways it gives us a break too as coaches. Mm. Because then they get to set up their cone or their drill or whatever and then they get to explain it to the team. And then you get to see them implement it. And in many ways, you are seeing what your players have been watching you do. So it's a reflection. You can see yourself in them. You know, again, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's not always about the wins, right? It's about where you see that growth. So when you see players step up and they're like, "Coach, I really I, this is a stroll I was thinking about. Can I explain it to you? Can you do it?" I love that because they're not just going home and tuning it out and playing video games or whatever. They're thinking about their second job. That's what we always tell them. Mm-hmm. You tryouts are like a job. You're filling out the application, the resume. You're telling us your skills. You're showing us what you're doing out there. Okay. And we've offered you the job. So like any job, you can get fired, right? That's sometimes it's the bench. Sometimes it's no bench, just the jersey turned in, right? How do we get fired from our jobs? Not doing our jobs correctly or not showing up. Yeah. You know? I hate to cut players and you know when I cut players during tryouts and the girls that end up being on the team are here and then some just consistently don't show up and then they get mad when they don't get playing time Um, that's hard 
because you're trying to explain to them, this is why, right? You want that playing time, but you applied for this job, but you're not showing up to your job. So I can't give you a paycheck mm -hmm. for not working. And all these other people have been showing up every single day. So they've earned that paycheck. They need to go out there. They need to go collect their money now. So now you're going to have to sit there and do some overtime because you're behind. Like, it's life lessons. They need to understand. That's why I always use it as a reference, as a job. Because you did apply for it. You tried out. You made the team. You're committed to this program. You know, to me, the fellow players in this program, your job is to show up. But we have practices and at games. It has to be an emergency. Don't go hang out with your friends and leave us here because then keep your team relies on you, right? So it's ownership, you know, like so much more. Um, but I love it. I, I love to see what they do. Sometimes I'll just, when I get frustrated, I'll take my book and I'll take my pen and I'll hand it to one of my players. What, what adjustment do you think we need to make? Because what I'm coming up with mm. is not working. What do you see that I'm not seeing? And a lot of times they'll look around and they're like, what coach? And I'm like, what am I not seeing? Because we're having a hard time keeping possession with the ball up where we need it. Okay, our wingers are not staying where they're supposed to be. What are we not doing right? Yeah. I'm tired of swapping in and out. Tell me. And a lot of times, they'll be they'll be hesitant. They're like, no, no, I'm good. But then there are those few that'll say, well, you know, coach, I think if we put this player here and we have them just go up and back here and they stay as our center back, and I'm like, you see. Because not only, but they don't realize, and I tell them all the time, when I ask you a question or I ask you to do something, there's always a rhyme and reason to it, right? Did I really not know what I needed to do there out on that field with the changing of the field? I knew. Did my player know that? No. So what I'm asking my player now is to think, what do you see on that field? Mm. So they are actually applying what, they're learned, what they've learned and they're showing me what they've learned by telling me, I see that that person's not playing their position right, but I think it should go here, boom, phenomenal. Mm. There's so many ways that they learn out there and it's just knowing how to use the tools. Absolutely. I don't know. And maybe, you know, um, I don't know if there's classes. I, I haven't found anything around here, but I think it would be great if like they had courses for high school students or college students that want to become coaches mm -hmm. or refs, but can't really take the time because they're in, they're in college full time or whatever, but they want to learn how the, the in and outs of coaching. Right? Yeah. But they can't really, like in high school, you have just regular studies, then you have sports or whatever, but you really want to learn mm. the ins and outs of coaching. I'm all for taking your practices and always changing them. Like sometimes you'll do homework, sometimes practices, you just do homework if your players are behind. Why not sometimes just implement an educational period where they're learning how to put down plays on paper? Um, and 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 how to come up with plays plays and things like that because then if they can learn how to put their own drills down on paper and, and stuff like that we might actually see more of these things coming into practice you know because for instance if you're struggling with finishing and the players are really thinking about that when they go home and you know let's say the player's a left foot you know, they're like, let me think about how I could make this work for me. What what drill would work for me? Oh, if we sat, if we set a play up, what drill would work for me that coach hasn't done yet? And then they bring it in. And then I look at their paper and I really study it. And I take their paper and I take it home and I put my cones out on my in my backyard and I'm running it. And I'm like seeing that to me goes so much further. Mm. You know, because we're preparing them for so many different things. You know, a lot of players need a fallback. 
We are always telling them to go after their dream. They want to play at a college level. They want to play for years. They want to go pro. What's your fallback? Okay. You can still coach. You can still ref. But they don't have the experience because nobody showed them. They just played. Nobody showed them the forms or, or how to put it down. So I think if we're doing all of those things, mm. then maybe these players that have a lot of mental crises when their college career is over and they have to figure out where to go from there, you'll hear a lot of them. A lot of my high school seniors, they're like, I'm never going to step on the field again. Soccer is over after this year, and they're crying. It doesn't have to be over. You can still play on club. You can still, they have adult club teams. You know, you can ref. You can try to coach. You can be an assistant coach someplace. But see, they don't know that. Hmm. There's that block there, or it's because they lack that experience or that knowledge. So I think that's why it's important as coaches, we say, okay, well, when you leave here, when I'm no longer coaching you, I'm still here. You can always still come. I I literally told one of my seniors, you know, when she goes to college, if she ever wants to intern, um, come in and uh, help out with some of my coaching from summer leagues and stuff, I would love to have her because she would be a phenomenal coach. Yeah. And sometimes they just need to, to be there um, and to be offered those opportunities um so i think we just need to not always be um, consumed with the soccer technical aspect i know and just try to provide um, other options for them outside of soccer when they come to practice i know a lot of parents pay for their kids to come and do soccer but there's a way to make soccer educational in so many other different ways where they're still, you know, they still have their foot on the ball, you know. Um, and then we, we, we set the tone, right, for our generation. Um, you know, good athletes um, with good foundations. And it's not about winning, you know, we don't. I think it's hard, it, it gets hard with athletes when dollar signs start going behind things, mm-hmm. right? Because we just, we want to make that money and the, the fans that can follow and the publicity. And I think to remember, you know, the work that you put in and, um, you know, just to always remember that it doesn't matter how far you go, just to remember about how you appear to other people and you keep a standard um, and always just try to be a good version of yourself is important. Um, But it'll be interesting. Absolutely, and you know, it's it's about this journey that's set players on, and I love how you say how can we develop them into coaches for the future, and that you you'd be willing to have them as a coach because you'd love it. And I can think of two players, which or definitely one player, where if he was old enough or or at my age now, I'd absolutely take him in as an assistant gaffer already because he is already going to be an amazing senior coach or or, or lead coach when he's older, etc. Because he has such extensive knowledge of the game, he's such a great leader, um, he's well respected by his own players, opposition, parents, mm-hmm. and he, he, he has all the fundamentals and, and making of a coach, and he sees what I've done, and because of natural role model and delivering the sessions in terms of what our expectations are, and then getting the players involved in terms of can they set something out, can they pack up, get, take that ownership as well, and we create essentially that family and community environment where we're all responsible for this session we're all responsible for the equipment the team and yeah. everything there then he's going to take that away and go do you know what coach luke was always there early he was always there late and then mm-hmm. as he as a player as that grows over time and he starts increasing his punctuality and he's there early and he's there later and he's helping pack away and his mum and dad are then he'll take mm-hmm. all that away into when he is a coach and because you know, coaches think they, their session starts at nine. They'll get there at nine and set up straight away and deliver a session. And it's not it's not the case all the time. Okay, yeah, you have to if you're on three G and you're back to back in terms of bookings. But it's not just rocking up at nine o'clock. So he'll definitely take that away as a coach and all these fundamental skills which he's developed as a player. He'll certainly take away if he goes into the coaching room, for example. Mm-hmm. So you know, and he'll pass that on to his players, right? Yeah. And so on and so forth. And that's great. 
that lets you know you're doing your job. You know, you're doing a wonderful job. Hopefully, you know, he's somebody that will continue to stick with it, and he does coach. Mm. Um, I think it's good if players play and coach. Um, you know, it just keeps you balanced. But, yeah, it's... I think it's always good, you know, to... When you have when you when you're able to pick out that one player, those few players on your team that just it's you could tell it's something's a little different. Mm -hmm. You know, the the knowledge base hunger is just a little different, and um, you know you you I think it's just really great that you offer it. You know, because they will take it. They will. Who knows? You might come back later on and say, "Hey, uh, it, is it all right if I work with you sometime?" Sure. Yeah. You know, um, I think that's that. That's awesome. Those are the fulfilling days when, you know, you go home and you see your your athletes implementing all those things. Mm -hmm. You know, because and, and in some ways, like when they step up as a leader, they they make your your job a little bit easier out there too, right? Yeah. Because then you can kind of focus on, you know. Do I really want to start this practice with this drill? You know, he's doing a really good job, you know, getting everybody mm -hmm. warmed up and doing it's just it just makes things so much nicer, you know, and it does speak to the coach and to the program when you're when you see that. Um, and I think as coaches it's our jobs to recognize those players and and continue to keep you know, pushing them um, and nurturing them. Um, you know, I have a soccer player who's tiny. She wants to play so bad, different colleges. And she she works hard, mm. works really, really, really hard. And I always tell her, just keep trying. Knock on every door. And if they tell you no, just keep knocking. You know, um, size doesn't always dictate. You know, you don't really need size on the soccer field. You just need to get that ball in. You know, I've seen really short players become 10 feet tall, you know? And when you see them on the field, especially like even after a game, when you're when the players are coming off and you're thinking like, am I gonna tell them? Because this was terrible. And then there's that one player that comes off the field. Okay, everybody. Can't your trains come down the corner, sit around the circle? Because we need to talk about this. And then you kind of walk over there. And then your athletes are taking over. Mm. And they're pointing at you. don't even have to do the talking. Because they know exactly what you're going to say. Because they're able to recognize it and point it out. And then break apart, you know, where we failed. I did my job, you know? Um, and it makes them feel good, right? Yep. It makes them feel confident because they're able to recognize, man, what coach has been drilling in with us every single day is we're getting it. You know, we're recognizing it for ourselves. They don't have to tell us. Um, and if I run late for any reason, which I know I never run late, but if I were to run late, I'm not really too terribly stressed because I know that my players know what they're doing because I have captains on that team that I know if I'm, if, without a doubt, if if I just got really sick and I'm like, oh, I gotta sit down on the bench, can, can you go up there and just tell them what they need to do? They'll do it mm -hmm. and they can do it. So, I don't know, I think it's, I think it's good and I like to have my players come up to me on the sideline but when they see something, a lot of players won't go up to their coaches and talk. Like once the game starts and they're on the bench, they won't get up unless they're called in, right? My players, they will say, hey coach, can I talk to you about something? Yeah, yeah, come on up, come up. And they'll literally break down what they're seeing on the field. And I think that's great because it's allowing them to feel comfortable enough and they're being heard. Again, it goes back to what you were saying. You know, they feel like they're recognized. They can problem solve, they can think this through themselves. 
and we're just being a soundboard for them, right? Because in many ways, they're just, they're really looking to us to say, yeah, you got it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yep. So when they're saying that, you just, I always, if, if they're never, if, if there are times where they're not on point with it or they're not seeing it correctly, yeah, I always have to remember to try to ask an open-ended question to get them to think about it so they come to that answer. But again, that comes from allowing them to come up on the sideline and talk to you, even during practices, regardless if it's at a game or a practice, um, or even through a text message, you know, ideas or whatever. Um, but I also like to put up plays and ask my players, where do you think you all would go? Yeah. Like if we're setting up for a corner kick, you know, we'll ask them, where, where would you guys set up? Okay, so when she goes to kick the ball, and where are you going to go? Where are you going to mm -hmm. go? Where are you going to And we want to see them tell us where they go. And well, most of the time, that tells you all you need, right? We'll be able to tell which players are getting or are getting it, which ones are not, or which ones need a little bit more help. So I think it's good when you can see them being able to just come up with their own plays and say, hey, coach, it's kind of a little bit off of what you did, but we changed up a little bit. Don't say anything until you see it. Just just watch. Yeah, that's great. I think it's wonderful. Absolutely. So I think, I think as coaches, we need to allow them to coach too. Yeah. You know, because sometimes, because they're the same age as each other, right? Sometimes they'll, they can talk to each other a little bit better at times um, or get each other to understand something. Um, I think as coaches, depending what age group you coach, there's always that mm. age gap, right? Um, my head coach has never really had a head coach, uh, assistant coach before. And the first time he's ever brought on an assistant coach. And he was like, if, if, if I could do this again, I would have found you sooner, you know? Um, and that's because as a male coach, he couldn't connect with the, the females on a different level mm. that I could, right? He can connect with them on everything else and they absolutely love them. I mean, the stuff those girls put him through is just hilarious. Um, for the breast cancer game that we had, they brought in a pink wig for him. And so he was wearing a pink wig. Um, and, one time you wore a pink cowboy hat and so there's a lot of goofing around um but see with me as their female coach they can also they'll come and talk to me about mm. different things that they can't come and talk to me about or i observe things that he doesn't observe because his observations are fixed on something else you know he's not a female so he doesn't always understand the emotions or how someone's attitude over there is not attitude. She's just being sarcastic. That one is attitude, you know, that type of stuff. Um, you know, so it, it's just having that, that balance. And that was something that he recognized as head coach, you know, um, it would be great if I had a female coach and somebody that was in the building. So the girls had somebody to go talk to and it's worked out amazing. So, Again, that's always looking inwards and seeing yeah. how we can um, make changes. And when I took over for the um, middle school, you know, I don't really have goalie training. You know, like I have no experience with that. I wasn't, I never played goalie. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm very physical and I can do the job. I don't like it. But to train, you know, my goalies just on that that's not me because i don't have that knowledge mm -hmm. base my head coach that's what he that's what he did that's you know it's where his experience is and so at times during our practices he'll just take the goalies and, and, and focus on that and then i'll take all the other players and we'll do our stuff so i thought about that coming into my middle school you know and you know i message him like can you can you come and help me out with my goalies and stuff like that and just be that male aspect mm. on the field that sometimes we need. Sure, not a problem. But again, 
you also run into, there have been some people that I have, I've asked to help and they don't want to do it because as an assistant coach or just a help, they don't get a pay. So they don't want to do it. Hmm. I'm different. I went through my whole season with my high school girls and I don't get paid because I'm an assistant coach, but I do it because it's far more than just the pay, you know? Yeah. These kids need somebody to show up regardless if they get a paycheck or not, you know? Because if we worry about, we're only going to do something if we get a dollar sign behind it, we're never going to better our youth. We're never going to make yeah. these soccer programs great because there are a lot of different teams that programs that don't pay coaches well, you know, and if that's the case, nobody would want to coach. And maybe that's why there's some ways shortages of coaches and refs, but we have to understand it's more than just the money we're coaching for more mm. reasons than just that. I didn't go into coaching for money. I went into coaching because I love soccer and I love coaching people. I love teaching kids. Um, I love the sport um, and I think everyone should have a sport everyone should be physical um, because it, it teaches you so many life skills so many vital things um, so I don't know I think you know we not not so much focus on money and wins and just provide good programs for our youth and and, and anybody and you know be mindful and considerate of what people can do. I wish we could provide programs to everyone um, so no one is left out and everybody has an opportunity. But that's not always the case. So if we can make our programs fun and get people interested, people will come out. Yeah. Um, the program will speak for itself. Um, you know, and sometimes as really good coaches, even if you don't get paid, you get really good kickbacks. Mm. Um, you know, just by your team for thanks and stuff like that. I always tell them my payment is just in the gratitude that I get from my players, the growth that I see in on the field and in the personal lives. Um, that's really all I need. Um, I, you know, I, I just want our, our youth and our programs to be positive programs for our athletes um, and and not negative um, and you know provide safe healthy outlets yeah that's important yeah I hope we get more people um, you know to organize like watch parties I think those are really cool mm. Um, soccer teams coming together and just watching the games as one. Um, I think it would be cool if, if like high schools, um, like for the World Cup, how cool would that have been if somebody would have just had like a projector out on a field and then like the athletes could come and they could watch it mm. as one. Like in Europe, oh my goodness, like my family, when whenever Spain played, nobody went to work. It was on a TV or somebody had it on a huge TV where you were watching it and you were watching it together and you were having a great time and you were talking sports. I think this year was like the first time that they actually had it playing in at the schools, but it was only during the cafeteria. Um, but it wasn't really available for everybody in the school. Only certain teachers put it on and, and things like that. So I wish like if there was more viewing areas mm. for things like that for soccer related that'd be great because they do out outside outdoor drive-in movie theaters just do an outdoor drive-in soccer game you know you might actually make a lot of money yeah That's a great it. idea yeah great idea yeah yeah i mean there are kids that athletes i mean people nowadays they don't even have cable sometimes because they're just paying mm. for what their netflix or hbo or whatever the ESPN plus um, so it's sometimes they can't even watch the game so mm. if we're able to provide it the viewing then that's more awareness to the sport yeah um, I don't know lots of lots of ideas we'll see where they where they go 
absolutely but lots of ideas lots of takeaways lots of considerations lots of information lots of content it's been an amazing just to sit here for, and take you back for two hours and like two hours has absolutely flown by like and it's just been it has, it's been great just to sit back and, and listen because sometimes you know as, as we delve into conversations you know you take things away you, you get different ideas but it's been great that you could express yourself and i could just sit back and just listen to you and it, it's really been incredible and uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you know we've done more than an hour and you will you have definitely taken the record for the longest podcast episode oh so my goodness, that, I'm that no no it's completely fine i'm more than loving it you know if it was only to be an hour then i would have stopped it on an hour but i've yeah. you know really enjoyed it and i'm so glad that you've given the time and um i'd absolutely love for you to come on again and uh i would love it absolutely I would love to actually give you an update of our you know our season and the middle school how that goes and yeah definitely I love that yeah no definitely anytime so uh mm. yeah we'll try and find some more time in your schedule but yeah it's been amazing yeah, yeah. i'll uh maybe i'll uh take notes on uh differences from the high school and the middle school um with practices and, and different things like that for the next time we talk That's, um, that would be amazing yeah absolutely that would, that would be kind of cool you know because i'm thinking about using rebound boards for my middle school and things like that um you know, some people have mixed feelings on that. Yeah. Like, you know, that, that might be a little too much. And, <laughs> but again, you know, these are seventh, eighth graders that are going to be funneling into high school programs. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I feel like the sooner we get them accustomed to these things, they're just going to be better players. Yeah, of course. And then we might see more freshman players on varsity yeah. um, coming right in. So it'll be interesting. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll put together a list of what did not work and what worked. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. And we can come back and talk about it. Yeah, no, that'd be really good. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's been fun. I'm glad. Thank you for considering me and bringing me on. And I've been looking forward to it for so long. I'm really glad. No, it's been a pleasure. And you've taken the floor away. And I think... You know, you'll be amazing to listen to and anyone who's listening to you will be really lucky. But I've been so lucky to have you on and uh, sit back and listen to you and I've really enjoyed the, the time that we've had together. But no, it's been amazing and uh, I wish you luck for the, for everything to come. But the, the next episode seems planned already and sounds fantastic to me. Yeah. Um, good luck with all yours and keep me posted on how that's going. And, you know, maybe I'll start posting up what my drills are and stuff and we'll see if we get feedback. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe not. You know, positive feedback. We need to remember that positive. Yeah. There's always a way to get positive, not negative. That's it. But it'll be interesting. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna do separate ones for middle school, separate ones for high school. So we'll see what what people think. You know, our goods and do's and don'ts. Yeah. But I look forward to it, and thanks for having me. It's been a blast. I'm glad. Pleasure. All right.